Hello and welcome to the presentation, Senescence, a Virtual Dementia Home Care Simulator for Clinical Education. My name is Richard Booth and I'll be presenting this presentation on behalf of Barbara Sinclair and the rest of the development team of the serious video game Senescence and the rest of the team is listed here. Uh, we were funded by a, a Western University Faculty Health Innovations Innovation Fund in 2018-2019 to develop this serious video game. What is a serious video game? Now, a serious video game is actually a video game, so a game you can play on a computer, but includes something that is a little bit more important and serious than just the gamification of a certain action or process. In this case, we decided to look at dementia and home care as the serious element of the game that we created for clinical simulation, clinical education. We had a couple different pillars that we wanted to really make a game around, one of which was ensuring that we had uh, the, the strong pillar of interprofessional education. So you can see from the previous slide, we have lots of different schools in terms of audiology, speech language, OTPT, and nursing represented in the development of this. We also wanted to ensure that we had unfolding cases. So whatever scenario we generated around uh, dementia in, in home would be a case that would follow over a period of time. So we could see the progression of various things over a time period, not just a cross-sectional representation of, of the clinical presentation. And we also want to attend to different learning styles of students who may be playing the game. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a step back before I step, take a step forward to show you how the development of the game occurred and then do a little bit of a gameplay demo for everyone to, to see. So in the School of Nursing specifically, we do a lot of standardized and simulation. So we have the mannequins and we have uh, students who use them when they're all cl clicked up to telemetry and all the other kind of biomedical processes that we can measure and things like that. So our simulation lab is, is pretty intense and it's pretty technologically mediated. Now, this is great, but unfortunately, sometimes it takes a lot of time and effort and money to have students work through this in a very kind of physical way. And that, that's important for students to do, but you can see that there's some situations that are very difficult to replicate in a simulation lab that looks like an acute care hospital unit, uh, especially things like home care, where students may never get the experience um, to, to visit a client in the home during their, their formal education at Western. So what we started to realize a couple of years ago was that we were lacking in certain elements of our education from a clinical perspective. Um, this is one exemplar here where it was medication administration using barcode administration, which all the hospitals in London um, had kind of adopted by the middle of the 2010s. So we created our own electronic medication administration software and, and our workstation on wheels. But we decided that while this is still important to do within the simulation lab, students didn't have time to practice this at home. They didn't have time to practice this outside of the simulation lab. And it's, if you've ever done medication administration using uh, CPOE and EMAR, it is a little bit complex to learn. So it's useful to give students the opportunity to practice this, this away from the actual simulation lab on their own. So we decided that making a video game of these sorts of things would be important. So we created the games that would actually replicate process that you would be able to do in the simulation lab, but would be able to be played on your computer, i.e. a serious video game. And this was our first attempt at medication here, where we created a serious video game around medication administration using the barcode scanner. And this game, while looking kind of flash and not the most polished, actually has all the intelligence of a of a CPOE or EMAR in terms of medication administration. So students can practice the process and the workflow and the clinical decision-making while clicking things at home on their own computer. So moving that forward, we decided, well, if we can make a video game around electronic medication administration, why can't we do something bigger? So we decided, well, let's take a look at home care and dementia care. So we decided that we will take a case scenario that we had actually used in clinical education and nursing and try to amplify it into a video game and create a video game around Bill and Audrey. So here is Bill and Audrey's demographics and we created a video game after a lot of hard work and development that created these avatars and these people into in a virtual digital presence where we could actually interact with them. So the Senescence game came from a really large collection of people's insights and knowledge and work to come together to figure out how we would write a case scenario around two people and have dementia and home care be the central foci, more or less, of the actual case itself that would expand over a period of time. So this is one of the first screenshots we had from our development company when we were first starting to go down the pathway of developing the game. So I'll get to the development of the game in a second here, but I wanna kind of show you some of the screenshots we have right now. So you can see it, we made a four series game and you can see it's based in Canada. So by December here on the right, it's snowing, which you can appreciate could become important if people have limited mobility. Uh, with snow and things like that. So we have created a game essentially that not only tracks the clinical progression, but the other 
facets that are important from a, from a home health and a home assessment perspective. You can see that we start in October here, and then the second episode we play is about 15 days later into October, or September rather than into October, and then to November, and then into the middle of November when it starts to snow. And you can see that the leaves start to fall and things like that. And these are kind of important things for students to see because if someone has limited mobility, which you'll see that Bill has in the subsequent slides, that knowing that, you know, maybe they are gonna have trouble shoveling the snow, that would be an important clinical aspect from a home health perspective to be able to evaluate and measure. So we have built more things into this game than just the clinical scenario. There is the psychosocial and the environmental things that we want students to be able to look at, which a simulation that is either done in the sim lab or described on a, as a paragraph on a piece of paper can never capture this kind of level of detail. So I'm gonna take you just a bit, a few steps from the actual game, then we'll do a gameplay demo and I'll show you the next step. So this is the first episode here. And you see, this is what it kind of looks like when you walk into the room. And I'll show you the game here in a second when I do the actual gameplay. But you see there's a carpet that's folded here. And he, uh, Bill has just had a knee surgery. Um, so we, he's had a knee replacement. And he, if you know anybody, he probably shouldn't have his knee up like that. He's not even wearing the correct type of shoes. He's still wearing his slippers. The carpet, like I said, is folded. And there's a bunch of other things that once you start getting around, you can see his walkers put over the side here um, that would be important from an assessment perspective. So if you're worried about trips, this carpet curve here would be something that would be very important to, I, to identify. And depending on the type of student you are, whether you're an OT or a PT or a nursing student, speech and language pathology or audiologist who's playing this game, you will notice different things about the video game. And as we go through, um, you there are more clinical markers and Easter eggs that we buried through here, including he has hearing aids. Um, and by episode four, this whole house becomes very disheveled because his uh, dementia symptoms have really kind of exacerbated. Audrey, the, the, the caregiver partner here, is not able to kind of keep up to his needs and uh, the whole house becomes kind of disastrous after all, which is what we kind of plan to have happen too. So you can see the progression over time. Uh, from a gameplay mechanics perspective, there's two to three options you can do um, for pretty much every action that you'd like to. Now, unfortunately, we weren't able to um, put in voice actors in this. We kind of ran out of budget because making video games is a rather expensive endeavor. So everything is sort of quick based. It's a find your own adventure. Like you have three different, four, three to two to four different responses for every kind of comment. So Audrey says, hello, can I help you? And you have a bunch of different things you can say. Now, all the things you can say, we had to pre-program and think about what would be the best course of action to say, what would be the least course of action. So essentially what we give students here is the opportunity to say all the wrong things if they want to. You could be very blunt, you could be very belligerent with Bill and Audrey, but you will get limited responses from them because we have a relationship engine in the background, which actually kind of checks what you've said back to them and then they respond accordingly to that. So if you are very short and you have closed-ended questions, or you're very kind of almost crass because we even have some of those kind of questions you can ask in there and non-therapeutic, you will get limited to sometimes no response from Bill and Audrey or they'll shut you down quicker. If you're much more open-ended and use therapeutic language, then you will have a much better assessment and interaction with Bill and Audrey. So this is one slide of one episode of one interaction. And you see that there are lots of permutations for everything. This game took me roughly one week after we had a script writer, because we needed a script writer to help us create the narrative arcs of this four scenario episode game, for me to rewrite the entire script using their framework with all the clinical intelligence built within it. So you can see that for every decision, there are decisions upon decisions that then scaffold into other decisions that then have recursive decisions. It was a terrifyingly large complex thing to generate. But what it really demonstrated to us is you can gamify a very complex solution and situation um, if you have the time and the desire to. That includes all the different types of medical things you could think of and all the different types of psychosocial things, including health, pain medicine. You see this, is, this slide here is mostly focusing on pain, daily routines, there's some medication, meal preparation, but you can see how one conversation you could potentially take in a number of different directions. And we have to enable that sort of freedom. So we had to create a very dynamic atmosphere for students to be able to ask questions within. And you can see here, this is another, this is an older screen render. So it's the, the features aren't as uh, polished, but you can see how they, you know, Bill by this episode has become really, his symptoms have really become agitated and he's digging through the garbage to try to find his car keys. Uh, he doesn't know that Audrey has hidden his car keys because he's not capable of driving anymore, but he's really fixed on trying to find his car keys. So right now we've had a couple of successes to date. Uh, we've played this game with uh, about 300 students from an interprofessional lens uh, last year in October, and we're doing it again, just in a couple of days actually from now. Today is the, um, oh, I don't know why that says the 12th. Today's the 14th, um, or our exposure rather, sir. So this actually the, the October event for 2021 will be happening next week um, uh, when we have about 300 students that will come together and play the video game. 
and talk about it and create a care of plan for for Bill and Audrey, which will be really interesting. And we've actually done that, like I said before, and it worked out really well. So I'm just going to drive you through a quick version of the game here, uh, and then we can go back and finish up with the next steps. So students will see this when they fire the video game up, and then they will be presented with all the boilerplate from video game development. Uh, and there's music you probably can't hear in the background, but I'm going to pick on episode one here to replay again. And just like I showed you in the previous slides, it will fire up and then you can, with clicking ability, walk up and start talking to people. And you can see Bill and Ari is like, hello, can I help you? And I'm gonna go with the best therapeutic response if I'm here from the community. She says, thank you, come on in. So I'm able to come in. And once again, it's not first person enough like some of the higher feature level video games where you can walk around in a much more narrative fashion uh, and fluid fashion. But um, for the cost and the development of this game, we're, we're pretty happy with where it is. We have plans for version 2.0, which will be a little more fluid. And you can see now that I have freedom of action to move around more or less wherever I want to. Now, if I were to walk into someone's house and just start to walk into their bathroom without being without asking, that would be probably inappropriate. And it is inappropriate in this game because remember, there's a relationship engine in the background. So I'm going to go have a chat with, with Bill first because Audrey told me that Bill was in there. And you can see that I can talk to Bill by clicking on him. I can turn off the TV remote. I can look at things like the carpet. I can talk with Audrey if I want to. Um, and I can even take a look at some of the photos they have on the wall if I want to. So there's lots of different features that you can kind of do. Oh, I see an Audrey, once I looked at the photo, Audrey starts talking to me about what I just looked at. Ah, oh, he looks very proud. So that's my only response. But see, I just got a bit of clinical information about Bill's love of cars. So you can see that that will become potentially important in the future. And it actually does become, because uh, it becomes a very important story arc because he becomes very fixated in his, uh, in his dimension systems around driving a car. So we bury lots of things in the narrative of this game to help us through it. And you can see that if I click on Bill, I have to go through a little bit because he's actually watching TV right now, which if you move out of this, you can actually see the TV on, but the TV is so loud that he can't hear me, which once again, starts to speak of some other clinical importance that he is actually having hard of hearing. And by episode two and three, we get him with a hearing aid, one of which he flushes down the toilet, but you can see how we had to create the entire ethos of these two individuals and the clinical complexion that they present to then gamify into this. So for you to play this game, it'll take you about 45 minutes to an hour to do it correctly across the four episodes. And to do it therapeutically, you would have to actually think with clinical logic of what you would want to ask next, depending on your clinical background. So I'm gonna stop the game right there because I, I'm running out of time and I want to uh, finish up with my, the next steps of the video game. But this game is freely available. We can release it to anyone who would be interested. I'm just hopeful that my computer doesn't crash here as I try to minimize this. There we go. So that was the gameplay demo. I'm going to finish up the rest of this uh, presentation here, talking about our next steps in the last two minutes. So we are planning to take this video game and develop it into a VR simulator. So you will be able to be in a room with Bill and Audrey and be able to potentially click and touch things with your, your handsets on VR, but more importantly, to be surrounded by it. And also hopefully into the future using kind of native language uh, presentation. So you would have um, be able to speak to Bill and Audrey and they would be able to reply to you back in real time, kind of like Amazon Alexa or Google Home. Those sorts of clinical technologies are, they actually exist now where you can have assessments to standardize patients that are actually digital avatars powered by machine learning. So we're exploring that along with its fusion with VR. So you could be talking with Bill in natural language and Bill could respond back to you in natural language, depending on what we want Bill to say to you, uh, we can pre-program to that to a certain extent. And the machine learning that can audio kind of present back in, in the natural language can do that for you. And we can see that there's other schools, um, both in nursing and medicine, who are using um, different types of VR. So we think that's a valuable solution. So right now, this is where we're going. We're gonna leverage the current state of the video game that we have, which I appreciate is good, but still pretty clunky around the edges because we ran out of budget because video game development is a very expensive endeavor. So uh, a lot of money doesn't go very far, let's put it that way. But what we are currently doing is we're building our VR lab to have some solutions where we can customize and develop in-house so we can work towards developing you know, the 2.0 version of Senescence. That's a much more real-time, fluid, and uh, first-person level experience for our home care and, and dementia uh, education in, in clinical realms. I hope that's, uh, that's helpful. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions around uh, the development of the Senescence series video game, and happy to take anything on email um, should there be any questions that uh, come forth from this presentation. Thank you so much for your time.
Thanks for the opportunity today to talk to you about our research investigating teaching psychology in virtual reality. We have been investigating the use of virtual reality in the context of integrative psychotherapies. Really, this has amounted to administering different interventions in three task formats. The first format we might call non-perceptual, but also egocentric in nature. This is essentially the approach to administering the intervention without the use of computers at all, in the traditional psychotherapeutic way. For example, we might engage in an imagery task in which the person closes their eyes and imagines a scene. For example, mushrooms on an island floating in the sky. The experience is going to be a non-perceptual one with one's eyes closed, but it's going to be a first-person experience of the task, an egocentric one, where I might feel in the task or in front of the image that I'm perceiving with my eyes closed in my mind's eye. Next, we have the two-dimensional experience, which is a perceptual one, but typically a non-egocentric one. Here with my eyes open, I might look at a laptop screen of an image. Instead of imagining it, I see it right in front of me, but it's not as if I feel right inside that image. Really, there is the barrier where it's contextualized within the laptop screen. And I don't feel as if the real image is right in front of me as much as it's depicted within the medium of the laptop screen. So it's sort of non-egocentric, but it is perceptual. In the third case, we have virtual reality where a perceptual experience is also an egocentric one. Here, also with my eyes open, I don on a VR headset, and now it's as if this image, no longer imagined but perceived directly, is right in front of me, as if I really have an egocentric frame of reference with the stimulus, as if I'm in the same sort of space as the stimulus. The stimulus is right in front of me. This notion of feeling as if I am in the same space as the stimulus can be applied in teaching as well as therapy. Suppose we have a student in green and an instructor in blue. The student is in their own physical location while the instructor is in a different physical location. Now let's consider the student's experiential location. In the normal case, where maybe they are viewing a asynchronous lecture using their smartphone. In the student's physical location in green, we see that they're at their desk with their smartphone in hand and the instructor in blue is depicted on the phone. Their experience is essentially that they are in their physical location, they're at their own desk, they're experiencing the professor's presence only through the medium of the smartphone that's in their hand. They don't feel as if they're in the same physical space as the instructor in blue, who is depicted on the right hand side on their own desk, maybe seeing the student through a Zoom video feed through their desktop. But suppose we had access to a head-mounted display, an HMD or VR headset, and a 360 camera. In that case, we could position the camera as we are showing here on the right in the instructor's physical location in blue, positioned on this chair. And now the student in green is wearing the VR headset. If the student has the video feed of this 360 camera, it would be as if their experience that they're actually in the blue room, the instructor's physical location, seated upon the chair that is seated in the position 
of the 360 camera. It's as if now they're across from the instructor at the instructor's desk instead of in their own room as they wear the VR headset and interact with the instructor. Here we have an immersive experience where even due to COVID-19 physical location restrictions, the student being in their own physical location might experience themselves as if they are close to the instructor in their physical location, the green versus the blue. These indeed were the kinds of experiences we tried to craft for our initial study of teaching psychology in virtual reality. This research evaluated VR as a medium for inducing a satisfying immersive experience of spatio-temporal presence to mitigate some of the effects of forced physical distancing and remote e-learning that was mandated at Western during the last previous academic year due, of course, to the pandemic. As hypothesized, as we'll show in the next slide, the group of 40 students that we tested on average experienced greater satisfaction when they viewed psychology teaching videos that had been recorded using a 360 camera while wearing a VR headset, actually just this Google Cardboard that you can see on the right, than when not wearing it. And this was an effect that was correlated with their greater experience of spatio-temporal presence in the teaching environments that we depicted through the videos. Our results suggest the potential for VR applications to provide satisfying experiences of psychology teaching in the context of remote e-learning. And we discuss future directions in subsequent slides. In this study, we chose to evaluate the experience of presence in the learning activities using our SIT or SIT framework. The S in the SIT framework refers to spatial sense of presence. This really has to do with whether or not the person was wearing the HMD or head mounted display whether it was on or off. We asked about this experience of spatial presence with the question, how much did you feel like you were in the same physical space as the instructor wearing the HMT or while not wearing it? As to the I in the SIT framework, this refers to both the interpersonal and interactive experience of presence during the learning activity. This really has to do with whether or not a person is in the video or not. And in each case here, there was always the presence of the instructor in the video. As to the T, this refers to the temporal experience of presence or the experience of presence in time. This really would have to do with whether the video was live streamed or not. And the live streaming is really a future direction that for our lab that was going to be made possible relating to some funding we've received from Bell and the 5G framework at Western. But this can be inquired about through the experience of a question such as how much did you feel like the instruction was occurring in the present tense in the here and now. So I'll emphasize that it was never occurring uh, live streamed. Rather, these were always asynchronous experiences as far as the recording goes, but the experience of watching the recording, the person may still feel as if it is occurring in the present tense, more so perhaps while wearing the HMD than when not wearing it. Now let me just uh, give you a little bit of an impression a non-immersive one, because we can only watch the videos in two dimensions here, but of the kinds of content, we actually provided instruction in these videos, both in terms of meditation and psychobiology. Referring to meditation, we conducted uh, recordings on various spots on the Western campus here, for example, on the concrete beach. Thanks very much for joining me in 
this practice of an open monitoring or mindfulness meditation. And just to give you some of the uh, results, while the participants were wearing the headset versus not wearing it. In the VR condition with the headset on, participants reported a high sense of spatial presence, more so than they did with the headset off. This is essentially to say that with the headset on, they felt more like they were with me here on the concrete beach, sitting on one of these chairs across from me as I talked about the mindfulness meditation. Also in the VR condition, there was a greater sense that it was happening in the present tense, in the here and now, even though as I've emphasized, these uh, presentations were always asynchronous, pre-recorded. Further, the satisfaction was considerably higher in the VR condition with the headset on than in the non-VR one, when they were watching the very same content, but just on their phone, not through the Google Cardboard device. Let's take a brief look at some of the psychobiology lectures that were recorded. Welcome, my name is Paul Fruin, and this is a chance for us to use 360 cameras, and if you have one, a virtual reality headset for viewing of lectures at Western University, Canada. This particular presentation will be on the 1020 EEG locations. And oftentimes people will be familiar with this graph of the different electrode placements on the EEG. But it's on a flat, sort of one page surface, two dimensional. And sometimes people will have a difficulty orienting and figuring out what this means on an actual three dimensional head. So let's talk our way through that now. Here is a styrofoam head where we have marked in pen some of the EEG locations. But I'll walk you through how this is done now. And so I let that play out just a little bit because I'd like to emphasize that we really think this modality using the VR experience is especially uh, more helpful if this is a really sort of visual and hands-on kind of demonstration of the material. Similar results were had when the content of the video was the psychobiology instruction referring to the sense that they were actually in the room with me here, uh, sitting on one of the chairs as I talked through the EEG locations. This was much more high in the VR condition with the headset on than when the headset was off. Similarly, they felt more so in the here and now in the present tense during the VR condition, and they were more satisfied with the VR condition than with the non-VR one. At the present time, we have received some additional funds now from Bell Canada through the 5G network that's been established at Western. This may make possible the live streaming of high 360 uh, content, even as high as an 8K, uh, so uh, a very clear picture uh, and viewing experience for the students. Also, just to think about the potential for uh, therapeutic uh, applications, we've shown for you the practice of meditation, but various types of clinical encounters could potentially also be crafted using this technology. With this, we really want to then establish the Pearl Lab, standing for the psychology of extended and altered realities for learning, using applications such as VR, We've actually, for example, done some novel applications applying VR to other interventions such as neurofeedback. So not just meditation, but uh, biofeedback and other approaches are possible with this technology. At this point, I'd like to conclude with that and invite your questions. Thanks so much for your attention to this presentation.
Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Yujoy Niburua and today I'll be presenting one of our current research projects which is on the development of an online cognitive behavioral therapy program for caregivers of persons with spinal cord injury. Spinal cord injuries, or SEI, have a devastating and challenging effect on individuals who are going through this life-changing event. However, it is also important to recognize that those who are integrally um, involved in their care are also just as affected. Assisting individuals after an SEI frequently falls on family members. And generally speaking, family members are unprepared to take on this role as the injury is unexpected. And it is often rare for family members to have undergone formal training to care for someone with such a condition. And a recent study reported that family care members family caregivers to individuals with SEI have five basic needs, and that includes economic support, need for information, need for training, social support, and psychological support. And if these needs are not met, then it can hinder the caregiving role. And several studies have also found that caregivers may experience negative outcomes, including high levels of burden, poor adjustment to the role, emotional distress, and strains on their uh, relationship between the person who they are uh, providing care for. And um, it is also um, seen that caregiver burden is often significantly correlated to feelings of depression. And although the prevalence of mental health illnesses amongst caregivers of those uh, um, with SEI is unknown, many studies suggest that a significant portion of, um, of them are likely to deal with psychological distress. And this is because they often, they, and this is because they suddenly experience an extreme change to all aspect of their life when they take on this role. So that leads to an increase in distress. And um, so these findings strongly suggest a need for psychological support to facilitate positive coping strategies. Among psychological management strategies, we have cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, and it is known as the most widely researched and it is an evidence-based psychological treatment that has shown to improve an individual's psychological health by modifying maladaptive emotional, behavioral, and cognitive responses. And CBT utilizes a problem-focused and goal-oriented approach to address cognitive and behavioral maintenance factors of various disorders, including depression and anxiety, by teaching people skills, coping strategies to manage and modify their responses to stressors. So here is an example of how we process negative thoughts before and after CBT. So before CBT, when we have a negative thought, we simply let it pass by without thinking too much about it uh, or really managing that me negative thought. So that negative thought gets translated into our behavior and how we feel, and this is now a constant cycle. However, after CBT, when we have a negative thought, we acknowledge it and we process it and we decide to manage this negative thought so that we can better manage our um, behavior and how we feel. So essentially CBT aids in managing unhelpful thinking. However, with traditional face-to-face -face CBT, there are several limitations, including accessibility and financial restrictions. Guided Internet Delivered Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or ICBT, may offer an alternative approach as it can overcome face-to-face -face therapy barriers. ICBT is based on CBT principles in combination with weekly guidance from trained clinicians, usually uh, through emails or telephone calls, whichever the client prefers, uh, for psychosocial service delivery within the community. And ICBT provides online structured self-help modules. And this has an advantage over face-to-face -face therapy treatment as it can offer greater consistency and quality of information that is presented to clients along with accessibility and flexibility. 
effectiveness of ICBT has also been reported in various um, health conditions and it has and the results suggest uh, that it has significantly improved their uh, psychosocial well-being uh, and studies um, these studies have also included individuals who have SEI and reviews of the ICBT literature are also encouraging for depression and anxiety outcomes. For example, in a recent meta-analysis, um, which investigated the effect of ICBT among those with chronic health conditions, uh, in this study, it, uh, it found that ICBT significantly improved overall anxiety and depression. And so these, these uh, results from uh, such studies demonstrate that guided ICBT is a safe and effective alternative to face-to-face -face interventions and it may be beneficial for caregivers of individuals with SEI. As mentioned, there are several barriers that exist for mental health service delivery from both the providers and the user's perspective. And so there is a great need for accessible and effective solutions to improve long-term outcomes for those who provide care for individuals with SEI. So the goal of this study is to adapt previously developed ICBT materials through a participatory action research report. Uh, research approach, and then uh, we will design and deliver a pilot trial to evaluate the feasibility of the program. To develop our specialized ICBT program, we first formed a project advisory team consisting of seven panel members um, from multidisciplinary backgrounds. And so it includes individuals who are primary health care providers, persons with lived experiences, and caregivers. And then we use participatory action research methods and focus group guides to gain feedback from our panel of experts to adapt and finalize the ICBT material. And the panel of experts are to attend three one-hour virtual meeting sessions. And during these meetings, um, uh, they are to review the current ICBT material, identify gaps that, uh, for the needs of the SEI caregivers, and provide feedback on the updated materials. And so um, the meetings are transcribed verbatim and analyzed um, for areas of gaps um, and improvements. And Essentially, the goal is that with each meeting, we will gain feedback on the current program, update the program accordingly, and then discuss the updated material to identify any further gaps and areas of improvement. And um, this will essentially continue until the final uh, interview, uh, so uh, until the third interview. And we hope that by that third interview, we will have our finalized program. And um, once that is complete, uh, once we have the finalized ICBT program, we will um, start the pilot uh, the pro uh, we'll start the pilot trial for the program so that we can evaluate if its effectiveness and feasibility. And currently, the study is in uh, is in progress. Um, so we have received our ethics approval and completed two of the three sets of interviews. And so now, during this presentation, we will be presenting our preliminary results. One of the most prominent concerns that was brought up by several panel members, specifically panel members who uh, were caregivers and persons with lived experiences, was around the term caregiver. The ter this term is considered too medical and more importantly, it puts an inaccurate and injustice label to the relationship between the person who is receiving the care and the person who is providing the care. And so as this was a major concern, a literature, a literature search was conducted and the term care partner was selected, was selected as it best represented the dynamic of the relationship and the person who is providing care uh, while also being inclusive of their role as, um, let's say, a spouse or a partner um, or their uh, children. And so, um, 
when this change was presented in the second interview, um, it was accepted by all of the panel members. Another suggestion that was widely shared by the panel members was the addition of resources and materials on sexual health. For most adults with SCI, um, they are taken care of by their significant other or their partner, and due to the dynamic of this relationship, adding resources on sexual health will alleviate any barriers and challenges around this topic and provide insight and strategies on how to better communicate and understand each other as they face this new challenge in their life. And other gaps that were advised by the expert panel members was adding information or resources on balancing family and home life and around children and um, having activities with the care partner and the individual with SEI. Um, currently, as it is not feasible to heavily focus on all of these areas as not every individual will benefit, we decided to include these challenges as case studies at the end of each module so that um, any individual who, who wants these extra resources, they can gain the strategies on how to approach uh, the challenging situations uh, by going over the case studies um, as it can help them understand how they can um, manage these situations. Um, and that um, these case studies also emphasize that, you know, um, it is okay for them to have strong feelings of distress and that they're not alone in this situation and that these are common um, challenges that are faced by many uh, care partners and that, again, they're not alone in this situation and um, we hope that we can provide some sort of um, strategy to overcome these challenges. In conclusion, our current study will lead to the development of a specialized ICBT program to improve psychosocial outcomes and the overall well-being of caregivers of individuals with SCI. And then we plan to conduct a pilot trial to examine the fe feasibility, effectiveness, and acceptability of this newly developed program. And we hope that uh, this research will improve outcomes and mental health care delivery for caregivers of those uh, with SEI who experience caregiver burden, symptoms of depression, and anxiety. And so uh, this is very critical as these conditions are highly prevalent, disabling, costly, and frequently untreated. So having such programs is going to um, really help them uh, gain skills to overcome challenges uh, that are fi faced by so many um, individuals. And lastly, I would like to thank the Craig H. Nelson Foundation for funding the study. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. Take care.